Hello everyone, my name is Özgür Damtok. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul, and I currently work at Memorial Bacilever Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about uh, magical procedure and how to guide magical procedure with echocardiography. Uh, well, I'll start with a short introduction and I will carry on with step-by-step -step intra procedural echocardiographic approach. Um, it's been more than 15 years since the first magical case and there are more than 1,000 uh, published articles on the topic and more than 70,000 patients treated worldwide and more than 1,000 centers in nearly 50 countries worldwide, which means there are now lots of patients and uh, a big experience um, and we are really familiar with the procedure and uh, we really understood the benefit of the procedure and it's been um, it's been proven with many important studies. And uh, in 2018, there were two important trials. One of them was COAP trial, the other one was Montreal FR, FR trial. And COAP trial showed us that uh, the patients with heart failure and moderate to severe mature, moderate to severe and severe secondary mature regurgitation, if those patients are symptomatic despite maximum medical therapy, MatriClip resulted in this patient group with lower rate of hospitalization for heart failure, lower rate of mortality, better quality of life, and better functional capacity than medical therapy alone within uh, two years of follow-up. And this really encouraged all cardiologists um, to go with a match clip for secondary mature regurgitation. Well, um, I'm really happy to share this uh, paper um, with Dr. Rebecca Han and Nadine Feza. And um, this paper showed uh, actually how important uh, the training in structural heart disease imaging is. We just wanted to emphasize the importance, it, uh, importance of it. And uh, there is a big lack of dedicated training programs all over the world. And it is also very important as structural heart disease imagers um, to, speak with, uh, to speak the same language with the whole team and especially with the interventional cardiologists. And um, to, be to be effective members of the team, we have to uh, create a unified language with all members of the team. And this is how the CAT lab uh, looks like generally. Uh, actually, our CAT lab looks more like this one, this, the first one. Uh, me as echocardiographer, uh, I stand on the left-hand side of the patient uh, with my machine and uh, our anesthesiologist stands on the head side of the patient and operators on the right-hand side of the patient. And uh, it is really very important to protect ourselves from radiation because uh, we as imagers are exposed to the maximum level of um, <laughs> maximum level, sorry, maximum level of radiation. So it's really important to protect ourselves. And um, this is how a match clip system looks like. Uh, this is our little microclip device. This is a stabilizer, delivery ha uh, catheter handle, a catheter handle and clip delivery system, stable guide handle and stable guide uh, is this one. And um, just to make you familiar with the system. And there are several steps, as I've told you at the beginning. And um, first step of the uh, first step of the procedure is the puncture, transeptal puncture, which is really very important because um, the whole uh, whole procedure is based on this transeptal puncture. If it is good, it generally will uh, carry on uh, safely and perfectly and smoothly. But of course, there are um, some uh, very challenging cases. Uh, as well. So for the transeptal puncture, we use mainly three images, uh, three views. It, first, we use the bicaval view, this one, when a cave is superior, when a cave is inferior, interatrial septum, and the right atrium, left atrium. Then we use the short axis view, the aorta is uh, here, and this is interatrial septum, right atrium, left atrium. Now, in the bicaval view, we try to understand um, how superior or inferior we are um, on the interatrial septum, and we prefer to be more superior. Uh, let's say here is the middle of the interatrial septum. We have to shift towards superior aspect of the interatrial septum. Well, after we are um, satisfied with the superior inferior orientation, we move to the short axis view and um, 
be just want to be away from the aorta. In the short axis view, to be close to aorta means going more anteriorly, and uh, to be away from the aorta means being more posteriorly. Why is it, why is it very important for us? It is um, critical because if we uh, if you are close to aortic valve, then uh, it means the risk to create a, a aortic annular rupture is bigger, uh, which can be mortal afterwards. It's really something very dangerous. So we have to, uh, we have to protect our aortic annulus and aortic, uh, we have to uh, hinder aortic annulus rupture. And the third view is four chamber view. In the four chamber view, we decide on the height of the transeptal puncture. Um, what is the optimal height? It changes from patient to uh, patient. If we have a degenerative mitral regurgitation, let's say we have a mitral valve prolapse, it will be something like that. And our coaptation line will be uh, mostly uh, above the mitral annulus. So in order to create an, uh, create an enough space to work comfortably um, and to be more stable on the, uh, on the leaflet, we have to be a little bit higher. Uh, which means five centim even five centimeters uh, is okay for the transept of the puncture. For puncture, 4.5 centimeters, uh, it changes from patient to patient. But let's say we have a functional mitral regurgitation, secondary mitral regurgitation with a big tamping area, or coaptation line will go down um, below the uh, mitral annulus. It will be something like here. So in order to be uh, in order to be um, stable and uh, close the coaptation line, we have to choose a lower uh, lower puncture site, which means even 3.5 uh, is acceptable in that case. 3.5 for between 3.5 4 centimeters could be chosen. Uh, depending on the patient anatomy. And of course, it is important to see the tenting clearly. If we are sure about the side puncture site, we can um, tell our interventional cardiologist uh, that we are safe and um, he or she can go uh, through the interlateral septum into the uh, left atrium. So we can show it with 2D images and also 3D TOE images. An introduction of stable guide catheter into the left atrium. Uh, it is also a very important stand, step and we have to be really careful about it because um, um, we are sending uh, our stable guide catheter and dilator uh, over an extra stiff amplatz wire which is located in the, mostly in the left upper pulmonary vein. And uh, we have to be very careful in this step and we have to tell our interventional cardiologist uh, about uh, the borders uh, of the left atrium, not to harm the free uh, left atrium wall. And by the way, by the way, sorry, I want to show you a, a stable guide catheter here. And uh, it is, its characteristics is, it has an echo bright uh, tip, like double ring. And um, during the procedure, we just want to um, want this tubal guide catheter uh, to remain in the left atrium. Approximately 1.5 centimeter of it should be in the uh, left atrium. And afterwards, after we are uh, sure, we advance the clip through the uh, through the uh, catheter delivery system uh, into the left atrium. And uh, one of the most important steps is align of the clip arms to the coaptation line. Here in this uh, picture, I just want to remind you how a surgical weave looks like. Aortic valve, if you put the aortic valve to the 12 o'clock position, or mitral valve is here, and um, uh, the mitral valve part, which is, which is next to the aortic valve on the screen, it is an uh, anterior mitral uh, leaflet and the other one is the posterior martial leaflet. And um, on the left-hand side, you can see the left atrial appendage. And on the right, you have to see the interatrial septum. This is lateral, this is medial, this is an, uh, aorta, anterior and posterior. And uh, from uh, lateral to medial, from left to right, it's like one, two, three, and A1, A2, A3, and the corresponding P1, P2, P3. And it's most of the time, if it is, um, 
uh, it's most of the time like a smiley face, as you can see here. Um, and if, for example, we will put one clip um, to the A2P2 zone, we, if we will start from this part, uh, to provide the perpendicularity to the co-optation line and if you want to use the uh, 2D images then uh, we have to utilize, we can utilize um, the uh, biplane images uh, and uh, here you can see the bicommissural view and here the LVOT view, this is biplane view and um, on the bicommissural view we have to see, we, we shouldn't see any arms of the clip Whereas in the LVOT long axis view, we have to see both arms of the clip. So uh, with this approach, we can understand that um, we are perpendicular to the co-optation line uh, indirectly. And so this is an example. Uh, actually, this is the same case. And the, we, there are two different examples uh, of uh, biplane images. Here you can see the bicommissural and long axis view, bicommissural, long axis view. In the bicommissural view, in both images, we don't see any arms of the clip, but um, here on the left, uh, we see, uh, again, no arms of the clip, but we have to see both arms of the clip to provide the perpendicularity. It's perpendicular here, whereas it is not perpendicular. So it's a good example. If we have a functional matter regurgitation, then um, if the analysis is not too large, most of the time one central clip uh, is enough and uh, um, we check the results and if the if the analysis for example more than 35 millimeters um, then we need we may need two three even four uh, clips depending on the residual micro regurgitation and uh, mean gradient so um, but the rule is we have to start from the medial side and from medial to lateral we just carry on like uh, first clip, second clip, let's say third clip, like that. And if we have a degenerative matter regurgitation, the target of the first clip is the lesion. If we have an A3 prolapse, for example, uh, our target is here. If we have a P, P, P1 prolapse, our target is here. And uh, then we put the, uh, we tend to put the second clip in order to stabilize uh, the first clip and um, uh, in order to provide a longer durability. And this is my favorite slide in this presentation with our uh, David Beckham. And um, why I put this um, slide to my presentation? Because it's really important. At, um, you remember at the beginning, I reminded uh, you that uh, it is very important to speak the same language, uh, the unified language with the whole team. Uh, as an imager, we have to know what happens if our interventional cardiologist pulls the device back, pushes forward, torques clockwise or anticlockwise. If our interventional cardiologist pulls the device back, uh, our clip will go medially. And I, I remember this easily with this um, funny mnemonic. It's if, uh, if interventional cardiologist pulls it back, it goes medially, Beckham. And if he pushes forward, the, the clip will go laterally. And if he torques anticlockwise with A, it will go anteriorly. If he torques clockwise, it will go posteriorly. And advancement into the left ventricle after we are um, satisfied with the positioning and everything. And um, uh, there are two approaches, but what is recommended is to send the, uh, to send the uh, clip when the arms when the arms of the clip clip is open, and um, but some centers, some experienced centers, um, they send it when it is closed. But what is recommended is to uh, advance it when it is open, when the arms are open into the left ventricle. And what if we want to check if we are still perpendicular to the, to the co-optation line uh, while we are in the left ventricle? Um, of course, there are some tips and tricks for that. We all know that uh, if we adjust, if we uh, play with the gain uh, adjustment, uh, we can just decrease the gain 
and we can see many dropouts and we can create a lucid mitral wall, uh, which means we can see from the uh, atrial aspect, the left ventricle, and uh, of course the clip, and we can appreciate that, for example, from the atrial side, we are looking into the left ventricle and we appreciate that our clip is still perpendicular and um, we have the um, satisfactory position of the clip. And after positioning the clip, and uh, after we are okay, we just uh, we have to be close to the mitral leaflets with our arms in the LVO TV. And then um, afterwards, the grasping part, grasping step comes. And with the grasping, uh, after we are uh, in the perfect position and sure about everything. And uh, we do the grasping in the LVO TV with help of 2D images and the tightening of the clip arms. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Tightening of the clip arms and reduction in uh, much regurgitation with real time 3D images, color flow of Doppler images. Let's show it again. Okay. And after each clip, the most important thing is to check the transmitral gradient because um, we have to be sure that our mean transmitral gradient is less than five millimeter of mercury um, because otherwise uh, we cannot carry on with the procedure. And you can appreciate the result after the mitral clip here with um, just uh, trace mitral regurgitation and this is pre and post procedural you can see the uh, significant reduction in, in MR and I like this slide as well because um, it really resembles the old eye opening and closing eyes and uh, it is like double orifice mitral valve and uh, we have to remember that it is an analog of a uh, surgical IPR method in the percutaneous wor world. And um, uh, when we put only one clip, we will see two orifices. And we, if we put two clips, we will see three orifices. And if we put, very, for example, two clips, but very close to each other, we will see again two orifices. And uh, after each clip, we measure the much love area with 3D NPR method. And um, we add them to we add them together and uh, we want a much love area more than 1.5 at the end not to create a uh, much uh, significant mitral stenosis because we have already a disease and we don't want to create another uh, disease of course mitral stenosis is dangerous and um, there is also something very important during the procedure uh, to conduct the evaluation in the same hemodynamic conditions and with the uh, same ultrasound machine settings, because otherwise it can be something misleading. Let's give an example. Um, let's say at the beginning of the procedure, the uh, blood pressure of the patient is um, 140 over 80 millimeter of mercury, whereas after the anesthetic drugs and uh, anesthesia, the blood pressure uh, is let's say 90 over 40, 80 over 40, which sometimes is the case. And um, in that case, if this is a mat uh, functional matter regurgitation, obviously we will encounter a less, uh, we will see a less matter regurgitation and uh, we will think that matter regurgitation is uh, reduced to mild form with, what, with only one clip, let's say, which is uh, sometimes not the case, which is sometimes an um, underestimation of the residual macroregurgitation because uh, we have to provide uh, almost the same blood pressure um, not to be uh, misdiagnosed. So uh, this is very important. And uh, in addition to echocardiography, LA pressure measurement and pulmonary vein flow is very important 
uh, to to evaluate the residual matter regurgitation because you know after we put the first clip and second clip there are many eccentric matter regurgitation jets which can be really uh, difficult to to evaluate um, and uh, in that case um, it is really reliable to measure the LA pressure and V wave uh, and um, also to, to compare with the beginning uh, with the pre the a bit the uh, previous uh, pressures and also pounder vein reverse flow is getting normalized after the procedure as you can see here it's here like uh, in the pre -pre procedural period it is like a reverse uh, flow whereas after the procedure s wave is getting bigger than d wave uh, and which is which means it's getting normalized and uh, which means this is uh, uh, supporting the mild regurgitation. And the orientation of the second clip is mostly by fluoroscopy and it is easier actually and uh, because we are trying to be as parallel as possible to the first clip and during advancement from left atrium into the left ventricle it's again under breath holding we ask our anesthesiologist uh, to create a breath holding and we advance the second clip uh, when it is closed second clip and of course folding of leaflet tissue between two micro clips should be avoided because uh, in that case uh, while we are trying to reduce the matter regurgitation, we may cause a bigger problem, a, a more severe matter regurgitation, actually. It is a very important uh, point. And as I've told you at the beginning, much mean gradient at the end should be less than 5 millimeters of mercury, uh, whereas much love area should be more than 1.5 centimeters square. What about all the immobile patients? Is there any extra points uh, in this patient group? Yes, um, actually let's say the patient is very old and uh, the patient is immobile and um, we know, we, we are almost sure that if you put another clip, uh, we will create, a, we will uh, result in a much, much uh, better uh, so, um, result in terms of micro regurgitation. Um, if we feel that, uh, if we have the signs for that, then um, even if we create a mitral gradient, I mean, a mitral gradient of 5.56, uh, 6, even 6.5, um, if we will uh, result in a much less uh, mitral regurgitation, it's like, um, you know, uh, we are trying to get the best result for the patient so we can accept it. It could be something acceptable in immobile and very old patients. And of course, peri-interventional echo assessment is very important. Uh, I, I really, I strongly suggest to check pre-procedurally. I mean, uh, before the procedure starts, we have to send the probe and we have to check if there is any uh, pericardial effusion. Even if it's a little pericardial effusion, we have to identify it and we have to uh, save it, require the images. Because uh, let's say we have some hypotension during the procedure, then uh, and uh, we think that there is no other reason this even the small pericardial effusion could be could be the reason of the hypotension and uh, we have we have to intervene this patient in that case uh, so it's important uh, to have the pre procedural images because if there is already before the procedure then it doesn't mean anything and uh, because you know it's not about amount of the pericardial effusion it's about the acceleration rate of the um, pericardial effusion um um, and the air embolism, we can see, uh, I've never seen thrombus formation. I saw uh, two cases uh, with this thrombus formation. It can be something really um, challenging and difficult and dangerous. And we have to maintain a, a, a ACT of 250 to 300 seconds and the partial and uh, total clip detachment and um, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. And uh, entrapment of cordae tendinae by the mitral clip, yeah, it can happen. I, I've never seen, but uh, it could be something really challenging. And persistent AST, uh, iatrogenic uh, AST. Most of the time, AST is small, um, but 
it can be also uh, bigger and significant if we see uh, if we see uh, the saturation and uh, if it is due to left or right shunting and um, we can think we can consider uh, closing the ASD during the procedure ad hoc. And what about follow up in the first month, third month, six month, and twelve month, one year? We have to uh, we have to see the patient echocardiographically and uh, clinically. And um, much, what are the take home messages? Magically, procedure is rapidly evolving as an important option among the current therapies for much regurgitation. Structural heart disease imagers are the eyes of the heart team, and structural heart disease imaging. Uh, is a NIF subspeciality and the NIF dedicated fellowship program uh, programs are definitely needed and much of the procedure is totally 2D and 3D TOE dependent. And as a summary, I can say that it is not as easy as it seems. Yeah, the, the steps are very clear and um, but it's not always the case. Sometimes it's, it really takes long and uh, it's really challenging, um, but helping patients and uh, being uh, an important part of the team, being the eyes of the heart team is really something fantastic and amazing. And thank you so much for your attention.